So down here at the bottom we have the the trash cowboys. I don't even this none of this makes any sense. I don't even know why people call it Calvinism. Hondo! 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 Hello again everybody and welcome back to the Hondo show. Archer of the Reformation mentions something about different kinds of Calvinists. I was somewhat aware of hyper-Calvinists, high-Calvinists. Some people call themselves Calvinians, um, believe in eternal security, but do not believe in uh, unconditional election or limited atonement. I agree with that 100%. I believe that we are depraved. I believe that we are unable to respond to spiritual things. Alan Parr, he says he's a three-point Calvinist. He doesn't, well, he believes in eternal security and total depravity and one others, but he doesn't, definitely does not believe in limited atonement. But anyway, I wanted to go through this this guy, uh, Felipe Diaz, he put together a pretty um, complete list of the different types of Calvinists. And before I go through where I think I stand, I want to go through the different types of doctrine and the different positions in the doctrine. And just tell you guys what, what I think. Um, feel free to disagree with me. I've talked about a few of these on the channel here I definitely do not believe that God loves everyone and that and that leads into a few of these doctrine before looking at this I am pretty sure that I am a high Calvinist and Arthur Pink was also a high Calvinist um, but we'll get into what that means in a minute uh, first of all I'll go through these different doctrinal positions um, duty faith what is duty faith Gospel standard churches, gospel standard church members usually tend to reject that the reprobate actually have a duty to have faith or repent in Jesus, Jesus because they're not to be preached to, therefore they say it is ridiculous to state that they have a duty to repent and believe. I believe that everyone has a duty to repent, meaning that God commands everyone to repent. And this is clear. In scripture Jesus commands everyone to repent at the beginning of his ministry and um, Peter tells everyone to repent when he gives his uh, his sermon at the beginning of Acts also because everyone is a subject of God's kingdom and because God is king he requires everyone to obey his law and to put their faith in Christ and to trust in him so everyone has a duty to believe. So I do agree with that. The hyper-Calvinists, I think, believe that since not everyone will be saved or not everyone is called or elected, then they don't have a duty, which is kind of a logical position, if not really a biblical position. Eternal justification, so people I, I've never heard of this, but I guess there are Christians who believe that some believers are eternally justified, mean have always been justified. I don't really believe that that is the case. I believe that we are justified in time when we place our faith in Jesus, when we repent of our sins or begin to repent. I know that repentance is an ongoing process. I don't believe that Scripture says we are eternally justified. It does say we are eternally elected and eternally foreknown. Anyway, I've never thought much about eternal justification. It's, it doesn't seem to be terribly important. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. So the, so the election is before the foundation of the world. Anyway, that, that's eternal justification. I don't, I don't believe in that particularly, although I haven't really studied it much. 
anti-evangelism versus promiscuous evangelism. The word promiscuous here is no pejorative connotations. All Calvinists believe in evangelism. All hyper-Calvinists are anti-evangelism. So hyper-Calvinists don't believe that we preach to the lost. I don't agree with that. We are commanded to preach the gospel to everyone. We are commanded because we don't know who God wants to save. We preach the gospel because God commands it, not because we know who's going to be saved or we don't know who's going to be saved. That is a ridiculous thing to assume. It's also wrong to disobey a very clear command to evangelize. So again, this is a, a logical conclusion. It's not a biblical conclusion. So these, these guys take the election, the doctrine of election, and since they say since God is not elect, God has not elected everyone, we are not going to preach to everyone. That is not what God commands. He doesn't tell us everything that's going to happen. He doesn't tell us to act on what we understand. He tells us to act on well, what he commands us to do. I'm assuming promiscuous evangelism means preaching to everyone. Which I do I do agree with that. We preach to everyone. Wellman offered this term is not synonymous with free offer, as some like to claim. I got this confused at one point. The so well meant offer means that God wants everyone to be saved. I don't agree with that. There's there's quite a few verses. Um, the one I always think about is First Samuel two twenty five, where God, where the author of First Samuel explicitly says, God does not want two specific individuals to not be saved. These are the sons of Eli. So if God does not want these two individuals to be saved, He does not want everyone to be saved. And then you have the, the whole example of the Israelites where God commanded them to wipe out entire nations. He didn't say preach to them. He didn't say proselytize. He said wipe them out. I want them dead. I want my people to be holy and pure. You know, to be corrupted with these uh, wicked pagans. And then you have Matthew 11 where two things happen that are very clear, but don't seem to make a lot of sense. Where Christ condemns these cities for rejecting him. Chorazin, Bethsaida, Tyre, Sidon. It will be more tolerable for this for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Then Christ praises God for not revealing his truth about Christ to these cities. I praise you. Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants. For this way it was well pleasing in your sight. Then he says that ultimately he does not want God to reveal himself to these people. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, anyone to whom the Son will. So that is. It is Christ's will that they not understand, that they not receive knowledge from God to believe in Christ. But then there's also John 1 that says the will of God. John 1, 13, We're born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So here John explicitly denies free will twice in two different ways. The will of the flesh meaning our will and the will of man meaning we're born not of the will of a husband purely of God's will not of anything else anyway um, well men offer I don't believe this because I don't believe that God loves everyone I believe that until we come to Christ and are in Christ God does not love us and this is kind of confusing it, Though at the same time we are elected before the foundation of the world. So God loves us eternally, those who he chooses. But until we're in Christ, this is just the way I'm describing it. Not, it's not, I'm not entirely sure on the way this works. But until we're in Christ, God cannot love us because we are wicked, vile 
unregenerate, unrepentant sinners. But at the same time, in eternity, God loves us because he has chosen us. And this is what Paul says in Romans 8. They were chosen according to his foreknowledge. So I don't believe in the well-meant offer because that would be a, a direct contradiction. Say It would be to say God loves the reprobate because he wants them to be saved and God doesn't love them because he doesn't elect them. So the well-meant offer doesn't make sense. The free offer is different because the free offer we see from our, perspe our perspective. Anyone can be saved. From our perspective, from what we see, anyone can be saved if they repent and believe in Jesus. But from God's perspective, the well-meant offer is not true because God doesn't love everyone. He doesn't mean for everyone to be saved. 2 Peter 3.9 says God is patient toward you, meaning those who he has chosen. This is from the very first verse of 2 Peter, to those who are called of God. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his glory and excellence. So Peter is talking to believers, and this is what he talks about when he says, The Lord is not slow about his promise but is patient toward you. He's talking to, well, he's talking to believers specifically or people who are in the church or those who are chosen of God. Okay, so I don't believe in the well-meant offer. I do believe in the free offer. Anyone can be saved. Anyone who believes can be saved. That is the free offer. The well-meant offer is God wants everyone to be saved. That That is not true. Um, those, from those verses in Matthew 11. Ezekiel 18 is directed towards Israel. It is not to everyone. It is not to the pagans. It is not to the, the other countries, the Edomites or the Hittites or the Philistines. It is to the nation of Israel. And, the, well, I believe they're chosen within Israel. Common grace. What is grace? Is grace always salvific? I don't, I don't believe that God gives salvific grace to everyone, clearly, because not everyone gets saved. But there is a, a certain grace that God gives just because he doesn't destroy every human as soon as he's born or as soon as he commits his first act of a willful sin. And we are condemned because of Adam as soon as we exist. But God lets us live our lives. He blesses many, many people who hate him with the wonderful lives. That is not really a blessing, though. That is more of a curse than anything. But he has created a world in which if we obey his law, even if it's not from our hearts or not from faith, but if we obey his law, we work hard, we can have a pleasant and more or less satisfying life, if not completely faithful, not faithful at all, really. So that I is what I believe is common grace. God doesn't destroy everyone immediately. Love for reprobates, uh, no. If God doesn't elect you, he doesn't love you because you're going to hell. That's not, that's not love. It is not love to say, okay, I I choose this person, and he's going to heaven with me forever. And I also love this person, but he's going to hell, and that's, that's what I have decreed. That is not love. God hates the reprobate. God hates the wicked. He hates all who do iniquity, Psalm 5.5, 5, also Psalm 11.5. I, would, I wouldn't call it love. Uh, Sproul says there's this love of beneficence, beneficence and love of complacence. It's not love. I don't. I don't call that love. You might call it um, grace or mercy. Maybe more a better word would be common mercy because God doesn't destroy people immediately when they sin. But it's not love. 
It's not phileo, it's not agape, or the other one. So, uh, I don't agree with reprobate love, lapsarianism. I think lapsarianism refers to the order in which God has decreed damnation. I don't know. I think I am a double predestination guy. The idea that both salvation and damnation are predestined or decided beforehand. Lapsarianism has to do with when. When he decided to damn people. Before the fall or after the fall. Before the fall would be in eternity. Super lapsarian. That's, that's what I believe. Because, I mean, it's right there in Romans. And it's also... I mean, Wesley said this too, even though I don't agree with Wesley in anything he said. If God has elected some for salvation and passed over the others, it's the same as if he elected them to damnation. If God has chosen his people in eternity, then he has made a choice, either by a direct choice or by default, for everyone else to go to hell. I mean, in eternity. So, uh, and that's, again, Romans 9. I mean, it's, it's everywhere you see eternal election. Ephesians 1, also. Grace of Nation, yeah, I believe in predestination. Double, these are kind of the same thing. Double predestination. Compatibilism, I do believe that men have a will that they freely make choices. But that their will is constrained by by their heart first of all if they're sinners and then when we become christians our, our will is constrained also by a heart but uh we're actually freer when we become christians because we have a regenerate heart but we still have a wicked flesh Anyway, uh, yes, I believe in predestination. Okay, so where am I? I know I'm not hyper hyper Calvinist. God works ends with means. I don't agree with that. Not hyper Calvinist. I don't. I, I accept promiscuous evangelism. I accept common grace or common mercy. I believe in duty, faith. Uh, I'll try Calvinism, determinism, yes. I don't know what this means many times. Promiscuous evangelism. I reject the woman offer. I do not reject common grace. I think I'm a regular high Calvinist. Uh, determinism. I don't know what moderate determinism is. I'm, I'm a de determinist. Super lapsarian. And I, I affirm the woman offer. I... Wait, no, I reject the woman offer. Uh, I believe in common mercy. I believe in promiscuous evangelism. I don't believe in any real love for the reprobate. Uh, but God does show them mercy. I mean, he gives abilities and talents to the reprobate. To have some kind of happiness on earth, but he doesn't love them if he doesn't save them. Anyway, I took one of these quizzes before. I th I would say I'm either ultra high or regular high. I don't know. I reject the woman offer. I do not reject common grace. I accept yeah, firm duty faith. Active reprobate repro reprobation. I don't think God. I don't know what that means. I don't think God needs to do anything for the reprobate to be reprobate. Just leaves them alone. So down here at the bottom we have the the trash Calvinism. I don't even this none of this makes any sense. I don't even know why people call it Calvinism. Salvific grace for all is that sounds a lot like universalism. I mean salvific means God saves. And grace means God gives power to to repent. God gives 
the change needed in our hearts to repent. So that sounds like universalism. And of course, that goes along with general atonement. Christ died for everyone. So this isn't even really Calvinism. I, when I first heard of four-point Calvinism, it meant every point in Calvinism except for limited atonement, which meant general atonement. But then self, you throw self of grace in there, and it becomes universalism. More low Calvinism, salvific love for the non-elect. Well, again, that, that makes no sense. If God loves someone with a saving love, then he wants to save them. But if he does not elect them, then he does not want to save them. This is, this is nonsense. These are all just varying degrees of the same thing. Lower Calvinism, well, men offer, many, many believe in salvific love for the non-elect. You can group all these together, 7, 8, and 9. Lower moderate Calvinism. Yeah, uh, just group these all together. Moderate Calvinism, I guess, is just Calvinism. Traditional Calvinism, five-point Calvinism, which usually means God loves everyone. Love for the reprobate. non salvific love for the reprobate, which... Uh, I don't know how you can call that love. Well, meant offer is love for everyone. That's what well meant means. God means well. God means to to save them, but that's not true. Okay, that's what I think, and um, I think I'm up here with uh, ultra high and regular high Calvinism. Definitely not a hyper Calvinist. And definitely, definitely not low. Okay, good enough. Adios.